listening to Living with ADHD and CPTSD, available on Apple and wherever you get your podcasts. of living with ADHD and CPTSD. Today's episode, we are going to talk about masking with ADHD. And as well, at the end, I will discuss a review of a book that I have been reading regarding ADHD and also go over quickly the medication that I am currently taking just to give you guys an update on what I am doing. So let's get started. All right, what is ADHD masking? Well, ADHD masking is when someone with ADHD presents in a way that makes them seem like they are not living with the disorder. It is also called impression management. The term was coined by psychologist Russell Barkley, who said it occurs in about one third of all people with ADHD. ADHD masking may also be called camouflaging. This is when someone with ADHD tries to cover up their symptoms by copying the behaviors of people who don't have it. ADHD masking may be a way for some people with ADHD to fit in socially, avoid being stigmatized, or feel more accepted. Types of ADHD masking include hiding hyperactivity with calmness, sitting quietly at a desk without squirming in one's seat, or responding as you are expected to during class discussions, even though your mind may feel chaotic. Masking may also include over-focusing on a teacher, task, or activity to avoid distractions and impulsivity. History and prevalence of ADHD masking. In 2015, Barclay wrote about the ADHD masking phenomenon in his book, Taking Charge of Adult ADHD. He said that some people with ADHD try and show others that they have it under control by controlling their symptoms. Research on ADHD masking is still limited and it has not been studied extensively. Barclay said that this is due to the fact that ADHD masking is a very difficult concept for people without ADHD to understand, so they may find it hard to believe. What's more, people with ADHD may be ashamed to admit they are faking it, and doctors don't always ask patients about the possibility. In other words, it may be that ADHD masking is more common than we know. Examples of ADHD masking ADHD masking is a way of hiding symptoms through learned behaviors that can be healthy or unhealthy. Many people with ADHD break social rules through their behaviors and may face shame and ridicule. As a result, they develop coping strategies to hide parts of themselves. ADHD masking can be used as a coping mechanism and sometimes may help people get by when they are young and trying to make sense of the world around them but eventually this behavior becomes difficult to manage on its own. Below are some examples of ADHD masking. Staying too quiet and being overly careful about what you say to avoid talking too much or interrupting people. Obsessively checking your belongings to make sure that you don't lose things. Reacting as you are expected to during class instead of how you feel inside. Seeming fine and not showing any signs that there is a problem when in reality, You are struggling to keep up or maintain relationships. Being overly conscientious about how clean the house looks, even though you may be overwhelmed by all the work it takes to keep it tidy. Hiding hyperactivity through calmness. So people think everything is fine, but in reality you have trouble focusing because your mind jumps from one thing to another too quickly to process what anyone around you is saying at the moment. Being unable to relax leading up to appointments and arriving much too early is a way to ensure that you are not late due to time blindness. Listen carefully and focusing too hard when someone is talking to not miss anything they say. Excessively writing everything down so you don't forget it later because of memory issues with ADHD. Obsessively organizing paperwork and creating systems to make sure you can find what you need. 
bottling up intense emotions until you feel sick inside without knowing why. This can sometimes also lead to depression. Calling in sick to avoid being placed in stressful or anxiety-inducing situations. Being irritable when you force yourself to concentrate on something that doesn't interest you for an extended period of time. Taking on too much responsibility to make up for what you perceive as your faults. Attempting to cope with the world by developing perfectionistic tendencies. For example, expecting that you will never do anything wrong. Overdoing something until exhaustion sets in so that others see how capable and reliable you are even though deep down you are struggling. Hiding that you may feel overwhelmed by your responsibilities leads to feelings of shame and guilt. A need to always appear in control to avoid feeling ashamed about whether others see your struggles. Suppressing stemming behaviors like leg bouncing so you don't disturb others even though you feel uncomfortable sitting still. And mimicking or copying other people in social situations so that you will be accepted. Impact of ADHD masking. Below are some of the potential negative impacts of engaging in ADHD masking. ADHD masking can hide symptoms, which may lead to a delay in diagnosis. People who engage in ADHD masking might be unaware that they have undiagnosed ADHD, which can lead them to develop depression and anxiety. If you are very good at masking your ADHD symptoms, people may not believe you when you tell them that something is wrong or that you are struggling. People with who engage in ADHD masking might also be at higher risk for developing substance abuse problems to cope with how they feel inside, which can lead to even more health issues down the line. ADHD masking replaces outward stress with internal stress. People who engage in ADHD masking can continue to go undiagnosed for years because they are able to hide their struggles well. ADHD masking can make it hard for you to know what is real and what is an act. You may feel as if you are not able to be yourself and instead turn into something, someone else that others will like you. Coping with ADHD masking. When you can identify that ADHD masking is taking place, you can start learning ways to cope without turning into someone else. You might be surprised at how much more enjoyable life becomes when you learn new skills for managing instead of hiding your struggles. Below are some ideas to get started. Identify which form of ADHD masking behaviors are healthy and which are hurting you. For example, learning to keep a reasonably tidy home might be helpful, whereas needing everything to be perfect would be harmful. Learn how to deal with your emotions instead of avoiding them. Seek out a therapist or coach who understands what you are going through. Understand that you are not alone in how you experience life. Connect with other people going through the same struggles so that you can feel less alone. For example, join a support group for people living with ADHD. Find an online community where it will be safe to express yourself without judgment. And the final words. ADHD masking is a way of coping that feels easier in the moment, but does nothing to help you deal with what truly needs attention inside yourself. By understanding how you cope, recognizing when your behavior becomes too much, and learning new tools for dealing with stress, it is possible for you to finally start living life more fully. All right, so there we go. So yeah, that's very true. When, when you're living in a way like this, because you don't feel comfortable with people, <coughs> excuse me, whether it's in a group or whether it's like one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you do have a tendency to do this and it's a subconscious thing for most people although a lot of us who do have adhd uh, i'm not one of them knowingly does this because they feel that they don't want to be someone who's looked at differently than others because of their condition they don't want to feel like 
sorry, they want to feel normal and they want to look normal to people, especially if they're people that they haven't met before and maybe they're looking at getting to know them. Maybe they want to be friends with somebody. It is easier if they mask. But the side effect, which unfortunately is true as well, is at some point they're going to know who you really are. They're going to learn one way or another that you have ADHD. And that means that your behaviors that you do are going to change because obviously you're you're doing a certain way or you're behaving a certain way and it's it, like you're faking it and if you suddenly start being different like let's say you're not aware that you have a diagnosis and you start doing this behavior this masking behavior you can for the most part appear normal to people and they think that you are another neurotypical just like themselves but if you start to feel comfortable around them or you start to notice that they're they trust you they think that that you're a good guy or or you are enjoying their company and you want to get to know them on a deeper level or maybe it's a date maybe somebody that you're trying to get to know uh, on a level in a relationship if you're incapable of keeping up the act of appearing normal or behaving in a normal way or masking you're it's going to come out and the person that you're with or who you're getting to know or is going to start to notice that there are these odd behaviors that are adhd like you can they're going to start to, you're going to start to show symptoms and express these unusual quirks that are ADHD related like you're going to have you're going to start having focus issues you're going to start getting distracted easily you know you, you could be in a, an important conversation with this person and unfortunately you get distracted or you, or you forget what they're what you guys are talking about or you know you're doing chores or you're doing a task or something and all of a sudden you get distracted and you forget to come back and complete that chore or maybe you know like there are other many different ways that you can get distracted and stop looking in your eye or in their eye as a, as a normal person. If you're if you're behaving in a, in a in a way and you're imitating somebody, eventually it's going to slip. So, in my opinion, the best route of action is to be honest. Like, be yourself. Don't try to pretend it's a lot easier if you just be up front. And if these people are good people and they're worth, if they, if they want to stick around, they're going to not care. It's not like that person is going to go, oh, well, you have ADHD, so I don't want to be around you. There is a stigma, and I get that. And a lot of people don't treat us the same way as themselves because as we are different. We behave a certain way. We have tendencies that to a neurotypical can be frustrating or ridiculous or funny or silly or stupid. You know, like there's all sorts of things that, that can be done or that will come up, excuse me. So it, I can understand why people who have ADHD would want to mask their behavior because they don't feel safe around that person. And I get it, you know, like I did have tendencies to do this, these sort of behaviors when I was, you know, when I didn't realize what I had. <clears throat> like the fact that I was like, I often would stay very quiet and I wouldn't talk a lot. I, I was, I was super quiet because I, felt like well i knew that i would make mistakes or that i would sound really odd or make or you know like or talk too much about myself so i would obviously do the thing instead of as just stay super quiet and try to be behave normal or by someone who's like or like the words i use is i i i just enjoy listening because it's 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 just it's fun i don't need to talk blah 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 right so that's that kind of that kind of thought pattern and that belief and I know, like, sometimes you just have to, like, I would know what I would do certain, certain, some of my behaviors were a direct, 
action because I, I knew that if I didn't, if I was myself, if I was being the normal self that I, that I am, that I had this belief that I would scare off people. And unfortunately, that was true for a lot of people. When I was trying to date, there I would scare people off. You know, it's just the way it went, unfortunately. But that's because they were, I didn't know that I had it, and they didn't know. So they would think that I was being just plain weird. And so it never went anywhere. So I started trying my best to mask my behavior and try to appear normal. And I, I wasn't exactly the greatest at it either. It got me into trouble sometimes because if it, it almost feel like you to the person that you're with or the group that you're with, they, they would either see through it and say, you're just being weird or it would be like thinking you're antisocial, right? Like, cause you're trying, like I'm myself trying to be super quiet. So it's just one of those things that you have to deal with and you have to learn to, to accept your disability and not try to hide it. So yeah, it, unfortunately a lot of people have to deal with it. And there are a lot of people out there who are not very open-minded or accepting of these sort of problems or disabilities that people like us have. So masking oftentimes is effective, especially if you're not really thinking about making any of these people close friends or if it's work-related. You do, a lot of people do mask when they're working because they feel like if they show their true selves, whether it's like their manager or other coworkers, that it could affect their ability to maintain their career or their job. And so they try to hide their symptoms by masking. Okay, everybody, I am going to take a break. And then when I get back, I will discuss this book that I have been reading on ADHD. And then of course, talk about the current medication and my progress that I am in. All right, everybody, I shall talk to you soon. Okay, so ADHD book. This book, Play ADHD. For those who cannot see this, of course, it is a book with the words play, DHD, the word A and DHD are black with the letters P, L, Y in red. And it has a toy robot that's blue with some red shoes. And it says permission to play a Prescription for Adults with ADHD. It is a book by Kirsten Milliken, who is a psychologist and an ADHD coach. And then I'll show you the back. I wish you guys who are watching can see this. It is really interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna read the back for you. Dr. Kirsten Milliken is a dynamic and unique clinical psychologist who lives and works in the Portland, Maine area. Yes, she has ADHD. <clears throat> Kirsten has used her insight and knowledge of ADHD to develop her playful style, as well as her professional services through ADHD executive coaching and play DHD. Kirsten earned her degrees and training from SUNY Stony Brook Alliant University, JST Coaching and ADD Coaching Academy, ADDCA. She is an International Coach Federation Certified Coach and is trained as an ADHD Career Services Specialty Coach. All right, so this book is built for the ADHD type. It is not going to teach you the scientific backgrounds and the information on ADHD as like some other books out there. But this is more of a playful, open, really catchy book. Um, 
it's designed, like I'll show you some photos and I'll describe it to you for those who are listening. There are <clears throat> a lot of very colorful like pages in here with, with pictures and well-worded, easy to understand information. So here we'll, sorry, just want to make sure you guys can see this. So like that. And then there's this page. So the page that I'm showing has information about famous people who have ADHD, like Lewis Carroll, Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Wilbur and Ordville Wright. So this, you know, different things. And going through, and there's a, like this page here. Yeah, so there you go. And it's got a bunch of information about famous people. And there's all sorts of stuff. Like there's a lot of really great information here. This book is easy to read. It's designed well. It has slightly larger writing than a regular book because as you know, a lot of books, the writing is quite small and it really it's really packed into the page, which is, you know, tough to read, especially for a person with ADHD. So there's a lot of really good stuff here. I'm going to read to you the introduction. Well, the first part of it anyways. Okay, so introduction. There's a really cool looking photo. It's a guy, for those who can't, it's, can't see this, it's a drawing of a man in a suit and he's happy and he's jumping around and got a big smile on his face and he says it has an ADHD certified button on his shirt and his hands are up in the air. Okay, so you have ADHD. This can sound like a life sentence to hell. You have a disorder, a deficit of attention. There is something very wrong with you. Capital letters with the all on wrong. When they give you the news, no one says, welcome to the tribe. No one focuses on all the cool things about having ADHD. And trust me, there are some. If you or someone you care about just got the diagnosis of ADHD, you may have a million questions about what it means. Are there things you can do to help manage your symptoms? Is medication the only or best option for treatment? Are there other choices? In short, yes. There are numerous options, including coaching, therapy, exercise, diet, neurofeedback, sleep management, supplements, and of course, prescription medication that can effectively address the symptoms of ADHD. Medication is the easiest treatment in that it only requires a prescription, a daily reminder, and some water. Medications generally work in 20 to 30 minutes, last for a period of time, and they don't unless you take more. Or, and then they don't, excuse me. Other forms of treatment such as exercise, sleep, coaching, diet, take more effort and persistence to have an impact on symptoms of ADHD. In fact, they can be considered work. Face it, if these methods were convenient, fewer people might choose to take prescription medications. You wouldn't take even a tiny chance of becoming psychotic or dying because of an issue with medication if there was another easy way to manage ADHD that made you feel better immediately, would you? And yes, some stimulant prescriptions list psychosis and death as potential side effects. I'm here to tell you, insert dramatic pause, there is another option, PLAY in all caps. You already know how to do this, or at least you did long ago. You can be playful almost anywhere at any time. You can be private about it or yell it out loud. The side effects of play are nothing to worry about. Productivity, creativity, laughter, and enjoyment. And who doesn't want to be around a playful person? Play DHD is about using the most effective non-medication intervention for managing ADHD play. It is my hope that this book will inspire you and give you some tools to start your own journey to reclaiming a playful approach to life and alleviating some of the challenges of ADHD that may be getting in your way. All right, there we go. So 
this book I find is an amazing book. It is great for people who want to get to have an understanding about ADHD, get some insight into it and make you feel more open to the idea that you can have fun with this. That it doesn't it isn't all serious and doom and gloom kind of thing. Like a lot of people could say that and feel that way. But I don't think that's necessarily this the case. Alright, so let's just see. There's a few other things in here. Just wanted to go about Oh yeah, this book is really cool. There's like up down upside down pages. Um, there's a lot of little quotes and stuff that are eye catching. Uh, it's like a dopamine hit when you read the book. It's really cool. Yeah, I like it. Alright, so, yeah. And there's even, like, conversation starting. It's like, it, I, I definitely recommend it. You'll probably find this book um, maybe at a bookstore. Um, you find it on Amazon or eBay. Uh you could definitely find it at the library if you take a look for it. So once again, Play DHD by Kirsten Milliken, psychologist and ADHD coach. I definitely recommend taking a look at it. It's a fun book. Not as serious as some of the other ones out there, but definitely not the scientific way. And for people who don't like to read like myself then this book would be better for you because a lot of books that I have read or tried to read before unless I'm truly really into it I have a hard time getting through even a quarter of it before I just get tired and bored of it and stop reading there's a, I have quite a few where I've done that it doesn't work great yeah, okay, so there's that. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is <clears throat> the medication that I take to help with my ADHD is called Vivance. And back when I first tried this in March of 2021, <clears throat> I had a doctor who, to be honest, was not really a great doctor. He gave me this medication but he also gave it to me at a too strong of a dose to start. And I was having side effects like uh, unusual pain in the frontal lobe, which is where ADHD affects the development of it. And it was making it work harder than what it was used to. And I also had a weird side effect that was like me being extremely hungry which was unusual because the other side effect that is common with this medication is it takes your appetite away. So it makes you less hungry because this medication is also used for diet uh, as well. They, they've, they've actually given it to people who are, are trying to lose weight. But I was getting the opposite. I was feeling super hungry. I would literally eat and 30 minutes later or even less, I'd be hungry again. And I'd be starving. Like, it wasn't just, oh my God, I'm hungry. I'd be like, ugh, it's, it's just driving me nuts. I'm like, you know how you think, feel like you're starving and you haven't had food all day long? That's what it would feel like. And so I remember he, it, I had to get off of it. I was over, it was just about a month, roughly. And I said, enough, I can't, this is just too strong. Um, but the stupid thing was, is that anything else that I was trying was not effective it didn't do anything so this was the only thing that actually worked and i remember back in december a uh, matter of fact december 25th was the first day that i actually started back on it and this time a different doctor who i'm proud to say is much better and much more informative prescribed me the same medication but instead of it being 20 milligrams like the old doctor did he gave it to me at 10 milligrams and it took a while for my system to build the effect so about two and a half weeks i finally started to notice the change that the medication was doing um, increased focus better concentration more confidence it just felt like i was actually whole a lot better right and about a just over three weeks later 
actually, sorry, not long after that, I got another appointment and informed him of everything. And he gave me a month's worth of 20 milligrams. And then a month later, it was 30. And just a few days ago, I am now at 40 milligrams of advance. And it's going to take a few days for the effects of the medication to truly be present. But I can tell you right now that this definitely was, is working for me and it's very effective and I'm very happy with it. I look forward to the effects of the medication helping me become way more focused, uh, better concentration, um, eliminating a lot of the problems that ADHD can occur or can happen with me. Uh, I have been told, and I don't know if this is fact, so don't quote me on it and say that if this doesn't work for you, uh, I don't want to be the one to blame, but I have been told that there is this possibility that if you have the right amount of medication, that it can eliminate all your symptoms and make you feel normal. Like that's the point of the medication. Now, I'm not 100% sure if that's true. Um, I can't say for sure because I haven't hit that kind of a point yet, so I don't know. But it's not going to be the same for everybody. Some people may not like it. It may not be with the right thing, or the right medication for you, but you never know. So I don't want you to think that I know for a fact that this is going to stop the ADHD symptoms because your brain can kind of get used to it and down the road you may need a bit more in order to have that same effect. And the fact that it is a stimulant and it is a narcotic, it can be addictive, which is not a good thing. You don't want it, you don't want to have that problem. So, although they do say that a person who is on the proper amount of medication, they have made claims that you can't get addicted to it. So, there's that. But yeah, I definitely am glad that I'm on it and it's been a very effective medication for me. I do other things, of course. I exercise a lot. I have a good diet. Um, I have tried some medica meditation and I do obviously therapy. <clears throat> so I'm definitely improving. I am seeing a lot of improvement when it comes to my symptoms and I'm very happy with it. Okay. So there we go. So remember, um, the masking part of this episode, I hope that is very helpful for you, that you get something good out of this. If you do have any questions, ask. Simple as that. You can reach me on Twitter. It's at ADHD and CPTSD. Just tweet me. Say hello. If you want to chat, if there's something you want to talk about, by all means, reach out. I am more than happy to talk to you guys about it. But anything to do with ADHD. My website is www.livingwithadhdncptsd.ca and you can check that out. You can also contact me through that website as well. I would really appreciate if you guys, the ones that, those who listen to me on a regular basis, if you really like this podcast and you find them to be very helpful, I would appreciate some help, a donation or a tip. If you go to www.ko-fi.com, so ko-fi.com or coffee.com, you can donate in two ways. There is a monthly amount. It's either $2 or a premium for $3. And I do have a plan to set up some interesting additional information that you get there that you don't get just through the regular podcast. And there is also a one-time amount where you can donate any amount that you feel comfortable with or that you would like to donate. It does help. I do pay for the software that I use to make these podcasts. And if in order to continue creating quality programming and quality podcasts, I do need to continue using that software. And any help from you guys would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For those who tune into or do listen to the CPTSD episodes, there of course will be one tomorrow. And I'm always open to do interviews with anybody who is interested in coming on my show and having a upfront and honest discussion about their own experiences with ADHD. I'd be more than happy to do so. All you got to do is contact me. 
Simple as that. <laughs> Alright, everybody. That's it for today. Alright, talk to you next week. Bye, everybody.